From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. 1590 Search and Rescue is conducting their annual winter training. I'll tell you the story coming up. I'm Joe St. George in Washington. Many states are relaxing their pandemic restrictions. Will the federal government soon follow? We take a look at the likelihood and why some public health experts say not so fast. Well, happy Monday, Southwest Montana. You made it to Valentine's Day. It is 631. Chet Lehman, Matt Elwell with you here. Again, don't forget. Yeah, you and Valentine's Day, what did we do? Uh, uh, we used to call it the Singles Day Aware or Singles, singles Awareness, Awareness Day. Day. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, a, uh, not a bad. By the way, this is the 25th year that I've celebrated uh, Valentine's with my wife. No kidding. Yeah. You have to think I, I about got a, it for you. I got a few more. Yeah. I got to do the math back on that. I'll get back to you here. You do the weather. Uh, I'll do some other numbers. Okay. <laughs> Temperatures into the 20s for most of the area this morning. A single degree out toward West <laughs> Yellowstone. Do you have to get the abacus? Get the abacus uh, oh, dear. I, He's got the abacus trying to figure out the dates. You, you caught yourself. I okay. It. I got it. Yeah. All right. Is it equal any of uh, these numbers into the 30s and 40s for close. the afternoon? It's close. close. <laughs> uh, we'll talk more about our chances of snow by tomorrow morning. The impacts we'll see and much more in just a few minutes. 34. 34. 34. Good job. Yep. It, you 34. had to take off your shoes I and had, socks. I had a lot of counting on yeah. where I had <laughs> pencils and all kinds of sticks on the ground. It was crazy. 632, our top story this half hour. Avalanches have already claimed the lives of three people in Montana this season. And the risk remains high with recent snow in communities like Red Lodge, Cook City, West Yellowstone. Now on Saturday, search and rescue crews near Butte trained for a worst case scenario. Our Caitlin Aguilas was there. 1590 Search and Rescue is conducting winter training for young and older members. To help members keep on their toes, 1590 Search and Rescue held an annual winter training to teach new members the skills that are needed and refresh seasoned members. We provide a lot of services to the community in a lot of different types of weather from flooding and uh, river searches to hunter searches to the snow. And so we have to train constantly all year long. Members were out in Elk Park to do snow training, which involves training with avalanche beacons, snowmobiles, and chainsaws. We'll be doing all the things that we would do if there was an actual search today. Callie Hosick joined the team when she was just 15 years old. She always wanted to help people. And joining the team has let her learn from experienced members what helping people is all about. It's a it's a really great experience being able to just work with them, be alongside them, and be able to just do something that really helps people, makes a difference with everybody. Brad Belke says that they do their best with the equipment that they have and hopes voters will approve their mill levy so the team can start training with the most up-to-date equipment and start sending members to get trained by the best in the field. We haven't been able to do that for the last 20 years because there just hasn't been any money. Belke says that snow training will help keep the team sharp and show what needs to be improved. And there's a certain camaraderie that builds when you're together and do this stuff so that you learn that you can count on the guy next to you. 1590 Search and Rescue holds these trainings twice a year. In Elk Park, Caitlin Aguilas, MTN News. 634 now across the country, states are loosening restrictions when it comes to the coronavirus, even though the federal government and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention continue to say masks should still be worn inside public spaces. So how close are we to the end of this health crisis? Our Joe St. George breaks down the numbers, the data, and why some public health experts are saying the country has a looming booster shot problem. Pandemic restrictions from California to New York are going away by the day. The nationwide chart of new COVID cases, which spiked over the holidays and throughout January, is leveling off. There are now fewer than 100,000 COVID-related hospitalizations for the first time in over a month. All of this good news may have you wondering if the CDC or the federal government will change their pandemic rules. How close is normal. For the moment, it appears as though the federal government will not be changing any of its guidance. Masks on airplanes are expected for a while, and some public health experts say that's a good thing because of an emerging booster problem in the U.S. It's woefully low. Dr. Eric Topol is a public health expert with the nonpartisan nonprofit Scripps Research, which focuses on data in American medicine. He says while the number of unvaccinated Americans is a continuing problem, the number of Americans who are not getting a COVID booster 
should be closely watched too. Around 60% of fully vaccinated Americans have chosen not to get a booster shot. Yeah, the boosting problem is a very serious issue. Dr. Topol's fear is that another variant could emerge somewhere around the world in the coming months, setting back all of this progress. And while he acknowledges being fully vaccinated still offers protection, the data shows fully vaccinated and boosted individuals are better protected. We've gotten the booster shot. While President Biden has encouraged booster shots, he has not ordered the CDC to change the definition of what it means to be fully vaccinated. Currently, the status is given if someone has received one dose from Johnson & Johnson or two doses from Pfizer or Moderna. You can be fully vaccinated but not boosted. Why? The CDC is preferring to classify boosted Americans as being, quote, up to date on their shots. Instead, a similar phrase to what's used when you get the annual flu or tetanus vaccine. It's a three-shot vaccine. It should be stipulated as that. Dr. Topol has lobbied to change that, believing all of this is confusing Americans who desperately want the pandemic to end. In Washington, I'm Joe St. George. In other news this morning, religion and politics can and often are polarizing. They deal with important matters that are deeply personal to us all. So it's no surprise the phrase separation of church and state gets thrown around a lot. But as Newsy's Alex Miller explains, one place you won't find it is in the U.S. Constitution. We're told to avoid speaking about two topics at the dinner table, religion and politics. But oftentimes, they're intertwined. If you take a look at the Constitution, the First Amendment guarantees freedoms of religion, expression, assembly, and the right to petition. It ensures that Congress does not establish a national church, that the government doesn't show preference toward any religion, nor can the government take away the ability for someone to practice religion. But nowhere does it say separation of church and state. That phrase came from Thomas Jefferson, a line he borrowed from Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island. In 1635, Williams said that an authentic Christian church would only be possible if there was a wall or hedge of separation between the world and the church. The idea of a separation within the church was born. Later in 1802, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association in Connecticut. This was in response to Baptists expressing to Jefferson they were worried about the freedom to practice their faith without government intervention. Jefferson wrote, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Jefferson didn't mean that religion couldn't be practiced or spoken about. He meant the state shouldn't tell the church how to practice. But should there be a line? We've seen the debate of freedom of religion in several national cases. In 2018, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of a Colorado baker who refused to bake a cake to celebrate the marriage of a same-sex couple because of a religious objection. And in 1962, the Supreme Court ruled it is unconstitutional for a teacher to lead a class in prayer at a public school. But you cannot take religion completely out of public life. While the U.S. Constitution never mentions God, every state constitution references God. God also appears in the Declaration of Independence, on U.S. currency, and the Pledge of Allegiance. Religion is also important for some Americans when deciding who to vote for. Roughly half of Americans feel it is either very or somewhat important for a president to have strong religious beliefs. According to Pew Research, Congress has always been overwhelmingly Christian. About 9 in 10 representatives identify as Christian. On the other hand, more than 6 in 10 Americans, or 63%, say churches and other houses of worship should stay out of politics. Alex Miller, Newsy, New York. Here in Billings, there's a young boy named Donovan who is an absolute ball of energy and good times, and he's searching for a forever home. <laughs> Eight-year-old Donovan is making his way through the second grade. You can see he obviously had a blast when this reporter volunteered to be a Nerf dart target. Oh, you got me, man. <laughs> he likes all the stuff any eight-year-old would be into. I heard you like toys, right? Yeah. What kind of toys? Legos, action figures, and Hot Wheels. What's so fun about those? Because you can play cars, like City, and you can play Call of Duty out with the action figures, and you can play um, Call of Duty 2 with the um, little Lego guys. When he's not at school or playing with his toys, 
That was a good one. <laughs> Donovan loves to play baseball and draw Lamborghini cars, trucks, and his favorite animal, dogs. I said sorry to my dog named Reddick. I love him so much and in my heart I really didn't want to leave him. And Donovan has big aspirations to serve his country when he gets older. Be in the army because there's, there's an army um, teaching place like right by my group home. That's why I really want to grow up and be one. In a forever family, Donovan had one simple request, a family with dogs and horses. I'm getting a family with 10 dogs and horses. To learn more about Donovan and other children awaiting adoption across the state, visit your local MTN station's website and search Awaiting Child. Reporting in Billings, Mitch Laggy, MTN News. All right, thank you, Mitch, and good luck to Donovan. 641, now we're going to take a break. When we